And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove, host and producer of the New Thinking Aloud channel on YouTube. He is also the grand prize winner of the 2021 Bigelow Institute Essay Competition, and he's the author of the new book, UFOs and UAP, Are We Really Alone? Dr. Mishlove, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Before we get into the UFOs, I just want to again congratulate you on winning the Bigelow contest, and I'm pretty sure that you submitted I don't know, 100 pages, 200 pages of information, but is there any way that you could sum up for us in a soundbite, NDEs are real? Not just NDEs, but uh, uh, nine other types of evidence for life after death, uh, including reincarnation, mediumship, electronic communication, the evidence is overwhelming. It's been around for 150 years. The, the point of the essay competition was to, to write an essay that would convince a jury, as if you were in a courtroom, beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, there is an afterlife, that we survive the death of our physical bodies. And uh, it was a, a pleasure for me to do it because I entered the field of parapsychology after having had, had an experience of my own back in 1972. Really? Yeah. Did you yeah. have a near-death experience? It, it was what you might call it a shared death experience. I had a great uncle, my uncle Harry. He was in his 80s. I was in my 20s. Uh, I, I was in California. He was in Wisconsin. At the moment of his death, it would have been 9.30 in the morning in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and 7.30 in California, where I was still asleep. I had the most powerful dream of my life. And Uncle Harry came to me in that dream, and when I awakened, it was so powerful, I, I found myself just crying tears of joy and singing a very sacred song from the my own religious background of Judaism. And at that point, I I just knew, you know, something something has shifted for me. And I, I was a graduate student in criminology at the time, working in San Quentin prison in the psychiatric unit doing group therapy sessions with murderers and and I knew I had to change my life at that point instead of focusing on the negative side of human deviance to focus on the positive side. And I can look back now, 50 years later, and say, you know, that was the turning. Did he give you some sort of message during the dream? Nothing that I could articulate in, in a logical way for you. It was a, a sense of overwhelming love, really, and and light and symbols that, like the yin yang symbol, which uh, we use now, came to me in in that dream as well, and a sense of uh, living one's life in balance. But uh, there were no other specific messages. Did any other family members report seeing him as well? As a matter of fact, yes, now that you mention it. Uh, he, I was his great nephew, but he had grandchildren, and I'm pretty sure one of the other grandchildren had a similar experience. Because hmm. I wonder if you had any psychic ability or psychic awareness or at least not any, but more than other family members, and that's why he was able to reach you, or possibly your age, because you just said you and the other grandchild. It's hard to say. I almost think of it as destiny, that, uh, it, you know, I am the person I am today because, in a large part, Uncle Harry visited me at the time of his death. But uh, what else is behind it? I, it's hard, very hard to say. On your YouTube channel, you're talking about your parapsychology degree. Why have no other universities on the planet awarded that degree? Well, I, to be clear, I do have a unique 
degree. I have a doctoral diploma that says parapsychology is my topic of study. And it was at the University of California at Berkeley. I graduated in 1980. It was an individual interdisciplinary major. I created that degree. Um, there are probably two or 300 other people who have done doctoral level research in parapsychology. They get their degrees in psychology or philosophy or education or sometimes maybe even in medicine. But uh, I think at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, they call it parapsychology and psychology. So it, it's really just a trivial distinction. Uh, that my degree says parapsychology. But the truth is, it's hard to get such a degree in the United States. And in England these days, it's much easier. But um, there has been, um, I guess the best word for it is hostility in the academic community to the entire field of parapsychology. So with regard, let's say, to the evidence for life after death, 150 years, massive amounts of evidence. And if you talk to a mainstream psychologist today, they're likely to tell you there isn't a shred of evidence. Why is there so much pushback from the academic world? The best way to describe it is that for the most part, academia is wedded to a materialistic metaphysics. Uh, they think that consciousness, for example, is produced by the brain. They have no evidence for that, even after all these years. Uh, or the best evidence you might have is if someone has a brain injury, it seems to affect consciousness, so the brain is involved. But the idea that the brain produces consciousness uh, is is a matter of religious belief. And, and so materialism is the religion of science. They cling to it uh, the way a, a devout uh, Christian or Muslim would cling to their religion. And since you're already saying that consciousness doesn't come from the brain, where do you think imagination comes from? Some other realm? I think uh, some other realm is a good way to put it. You could call it the, the super sensible realms, the realms beyond our normal senses that most people don't appreciate. I think that the, the human mind is vast. It, it encompasses the entire universe, actually. And uh, the ca capabilities of the imagination are virtually infinite. All right, you had the shared death experience. Did you have some sort of UFO experience that was the catalyst for you writing this book? Well, to be clear, what the book is, is a collection of interview transcripts, the part of the New Thinking Aloud Dialogues series. So I interviewed uh, about 10 uh, people, some of the leading researchers in UFOs, including old interviews with John Mack and Jacques Vallée and many other uh, contemporary interviewers. So, so that's what the book is about. But I myself, when I was still a graduate student in, in Berkeley studying parapsychology, I uh, encountered people who had enormous psychic talents, Uri Geller, the great Israeli psychic, being one such person, and another one who I studied for 10 years, a man named Ted Owens, who I wrote a book about him called The PK Man. He claimed to have extraordinary psychokinetic abilities, mind over matter, uh, focusing on large-scale phenomenon, hurricanes, tornadoes, and among other things, UFO appearances. He said he could summon UFOs, and he did. And I documented that in uh, in my research as a graduate student. And, and so from early on, I've been aware of this connection between para normal parapsychology and the field of ufology. And I can tell you, it got me into a lot of trouble. I had one of my professors, a parapsychologist, a very good one, Robert Morris dropped out of my committee when I began looking at UFOs. He said, 
these two fields uh, cannot combine. Parapsychology has enough trouble on its own. We don't need to complicate things any further by bringing in UFOs. But the truth is, if, if you talk to gifted people, you will find that many of them have various types of UFO encounters or encounters with non-human beings. Uh, uh, so it, it's, in my view, a mistake to ignore the overlap between these two fields. What I've come to notice is that many near-death experiencers either A, see non-human beings on the other side, or after their experience, start having contact, which I think what's happening is either their awareness changes or something about their own energy signature changes where the ETs can spot them among the rest of us. Can you comment on that? I think that there's a, an overlap between a wide range of um, phenomena out-of-body experience, near-death experience, contact with aliens, contact with spirits. Uh, there's a, a fellow, maybe you've encountered his work, Ray Hernandez, who says mm -hmm. they are all part of a single type of phenomenon. He calls it the mind of God, that uh, all of these things are expressions of the mind of of God. And when you open up to any one of them, you're likely to experience some of the others. In the old days, people were even apprehensive of sharing their NDEs. But that's yeah. not really happening anymore. But they're still apprehensive of sharing their UFO encounters. But the government had a policy. This is one of the topics uh, covered in, in our book. It began in 1954 when uh, there was a big UFO flap, UFO seen over Washington, D.C. The government convened uh, what is now known as the Robertson Panel to uh, assess what are we going to do about all this. And they were very concerned that it could cause panic in, in the general public. They hearkened back to the 19... 30s, I think it was when Orson Welles did his radio broadcast of, of the H.G. Uh, Wells book, War of the Worlds, and many people thought it was a news broadcast that we were being invaded by Martians, and they literally tied up the telephone lines back, back then. And so the government was, was concerned that if they acknowledged the, this phenomenon, uh, it could cause Panic. It could interfere with communications. It might be a result in weakening our defensive postures. So they developed a policy of debunking these cases and trying to dismiss them. And as a result, many people who had legitimate UFO sightings were accused by uh, government officials of being off their rocker in one way or another, and uh, including people in the military who had such sightings. And that created an atmosphere of fear amongst people. And of course, the, the same atmosphere already existed for people who reported seeing spirits or having other forms of paranormal experience. Uh, I can tell you Every parapsychologist I know, when they give public talks, people will come up to them and say, I'd like to tell you about my experience. And so many times they say, and I've never told anybody before. People are still, even today, uh, afraid to talk about it. But near-death experiences are, have been around now since Raymond Moody wrote about it in 1975. You, and, and also the government policy seems to be changing now with regard to UFOs. The government is beginning to acknowledge that something is going on and we don't know what it is. So uh, people are slowly feeling more and more encouraged to open up. Do you feel that the government still thinks that we will go into some sort of mass hysteria if a UFO lands in Walmart parking lot? I think the government is divided 
There, there are different camps, especially the U.S. government is very large, and, and there are uh, competing interests who are trying to control the narrative in, in this right now. There are still those who feel that uh, for national security purposes, we don't want uh, other people, to, particularly other countries, to know that these are real, because as far as I know, the U.S. government may very well have captured actual alien craft and they uh, have had them for decades. They're trying to reverse engineer them and uh, see what kind of weapon potential they may have. And uh, obviously, whoever can master this technology will have a huge military advantage over other countries. And, and so that's a motive now for uh, some government officials to say, you know, we don't know anything, none of this is real, uh, because they want to protect what they do know. Well, how much progress do you think we have made in our understanding of UFOs and UAPs? I think the real progress has come from uh, civilians. Uh, I think that uh, there are pioneers, people like Jacques Vallée, who has been looking at this going back to the 1960s. Uh, he and many other researchers have come to understand that there is, is an overlap between the, the UFO phenomenon and the sorts of things as shamans and uh, indigenous people uh, around the world seem to have understood for a long time. American Indians, for example, uh, many different tribes talk about their knowledge of the star people, so that uh, the, the lore of angels, for example, has a lot of overlap with UFO phenomenon. And if, if we think of these strictly as nuts and bolts spacecraft coming from other planets in our galaxy, that uh, that is a very narrow way to conceive of of the phenomenon. It's obviously when you begin to look at the individual cases, it's much richer than that, and much more in accord with uh, what we know about um, things that have been relegated to mythology. Do you think that the human being is purely a result of evolution? Or do you think we've been tinkered with by ETs? There's good reason to think that uh, advanced beings from elsewhere may have done some sort of genetic manipulation uh, at, at some point in time, maybe two or 300,000 years ago. Modern Homo sapiens are uh, very distinct from our primate cousins. We have speech. Uh, we have uh, the ability, not just tool making, it's well known now that uh, chimpanzees, for example, can make primitive tools and, and use them. But we make computers. We, we, we are another order of uh, species completely. One might say that the human kingdom uh, is, differs from the animal kingdom. In, in very important ways. So what happened? What happened around two, 300,000 years ago to, to cause that? I think it's not totally understood. And uh, obviously, there, there, there are people like Zechariah Sitchin, who takes a look at the ancient Sumerian uh, literature and claims that it, 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 the way he reads it, I, other scholars disagree, but he reads it as saying that the ancient gods came and performed genetic experiments on uh, the primitive uh, primates that existed at the time, and that's how the modern humans came into being. Uh, I don't think that, that we should discount that hypothesis. I think that it's a, a viable hypothesis. I've been thinking lately that if humans were at the same level of intelligence as monkeys, that we probably wouldn't survive because we are more of a fragile being physically than monkeys and many other animals on this planet. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, our advantage, of course, is, is that we make spears and mm -hmm. bows and arrows and uh, other tools that, that's made us probably a much better hunter than other primates. 
some of my guests on my program have UFO and UAP reports that may be completely unbelievable for a lot of people. Should we be paying attention to those? From my point of view, the more unbelievable it is, the more it deserves our attention. We need to really look carefully at events of high strangeness, the uh, really bizarre things, because they're saying something very important to us about the nature of reality. And, you know, it's a normal human tendency when you hear something bizarre to just dismiss it because it doesn't fit into any of our regular intellectual categories. We don't know what to do with it. So we just say, well, it's probably not true and pay no further attention. But if you collect those stories, you begin to see that they form patterns and, and that uh, they are very, very important clues, I think, it, it's to the nature of reality itself. Do you think it's possible that there is some sort of faction of extraterrestrials out there controlling this planet? I suppose it's a possibility, but I would be very concerned about uh, people who form conspiracy theories and who tend towards paranoia. Uh, I do hear from people. I hear from viewers often who feel that somebody else is controlling their life. It's the elites, or it's the uh, globalists, or it's the aliens, or the archons. And it, it seems to me that it, that's a psychological symptom of a, a, a person who is not taking control of their own life. So I, I'm very skeptical when I, I hear that from people. But intellectually speaking, yes, it is a possibility. Sometimes when I look at the comments... I'll see things like aliens are actually demons. Do you see that within your own videos? Well, in fact, I did a fascinating interview with a uh, fellow named Charles Upton. He's a, uh, a poet. He was one of the youngest of the beat generation of poets. When he was in high school, his poetry was published by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, a City Light Books in San Francisco, who was the, the big publisher of the beat generation of poets. And then subsequently, he converted to Islam, he became a Sufi. And he says that, uh, uh, he's written a book about it, that the accounts of UFOs appear very much like what the Muslims call the jinns, or we would say in English, genies, like in Aladdin's lamp and so on. So he thinks that, you know, these are an order of non-physical beings who have the capability of going back and forth between the supersensible realms and the physical realm. And uh, they are typically very mischievous. They can be harmful. Uh, some of them are beneficial. Many of them are not. Uh, so there, there's something to be said about that. Uh, however, if if you become a Christian fundamentalist and think of these as, as demons in that sense who are out to steal your soul, I, th I think that uh, that level of mythology is not consistent with the, with the data, whereas if you think of them as mischievous uh, troublemakers, uh, that, that's a little bit more uh, akin to what the data suggests. Have you ever considered that there may be some race of extraterrestrials that's been living with us the whole time, but are undetectable? Yes, I, I considered that. There's a, a large literature uh, to that effect. I have talked to people who say they have seen extraterrestrial beings walking here on this planet and they know they're extraterrestrial because you get near them and you have certain telepathic sensations they're reading your mind or you can read their mind briefly um, i i don't discount those reports i don't know quite what to make of them but if if we go back to the earlier suggestion that the modern human species was 
a, a genetic experiment performed hundreds of thousands of years ago by some uh, intelligent beings from some elsewhere, uh, maybe another planet, maybe another dimension. Uh, if, if they did that hundreds of thousands of years ago, it's reasonable to suspect they've stayed around to write, watch the result of their experiment. And uh, they may have lifespans very, very different from ours. For example, one of my professors when I was a student at Berkeley was a man named James Harder, who at the time was the director of research for one of the major civilian UFO research groups known as the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. And he specialized in hypnotizing people who had reports of face-to-face -face encounters with alien beings. And according to his research, there are races of extraterrestrial or beings from elsewhere uh, whose lifespan is much longer than ours, that they typically live 20,000 years in, in, <laughs> instead of 80 or 90 years. It's so great that you brought up hypnotherapy because our consciousnesses are linking up. I was just about to ask you your opinion on the validity and the credibility of hypnotherapy, especially relating to people recounting being with ETs. When you use the term hypnotherapy, of course, it suggests a form of psychotherapy. And hypnosis is very effective uh, as a form of psychotherapy uh, on many different levels, from self-esteem issues to uh, breaking bad habits uh, to uh, addictions. Uh, so I'm a very big proponent of hypnotherapy. But you're asking a different question, which is, is hypnosis useful as a research tool to investigate things like past lives or alien encounters? And there you have to be very careful because uh, there's every reason to think that the biases that the hypnotist has are transmitted to the subject of hypnosis, even it could be telepathic for all I know, but it could be through in tone of voice or body language. So people who are under hypnosis will tend to give responses that they think will be pleasing to the hypnotist. That's why stage hypnotists are so successful in getting people to do funny things on stage that they might never do in normal life because in that altered state of consciousness, they want to please. And, and, and if you're a good hypnotic subject, that you, you can do that. So that's one reason why, for example, people in parapsychology who research the question of reincarnation have a uh, low opinion of cases that come to them through hypnotherapy. Uh, on the other hand, to be clear, there have been some very persuasive books written by people who experienced past lives under hypnotherapy and then went and did the research and found that they could validate the information that came to them through hypnosis. But uh, you really do need independent sources of, of validation. If we get back to spirituality and UFOs, do you think that the majority of the UFOs are existing in a different dimension and especially traveling through different dimensions because traveling the speed of light is not fast enough. <laughs> it's a complex question. Of course, we could talk about the, the speed of light. If you're on a photon, it's instantaneous. You can go from one end of the universe to the other. And if you were wearing wow. a watch, no time would pass. In fact, no space would pass. That's the basis of Einstein's theory of relativity. The speed of light is what we see if we're watching on Earth. But if you're on a photon, it's, it's very different. And that's why uh, Einstein and other physicists have said that space and time are secondary. They're, they're not basic to reality. Space and time are properties that emerge out of uh, motion. 
And uh, ultimately, when you're traveling at the speed of light, there is no space or no time. But if you're traveling at that speed, would you cease to have solid form? Well, that's a very good question. And of course, uh, no human being uh, or even any any object of, that has any mass whatsoever has, has ever been observed traveling at the speed of light. Photons have zero mass. So uh, they're, they're very special. Light is, is really quite an amazing phenomenon. But back to your original question about other dimensions, it's well understood in mathematics and, uh, and in uh, certain branches of physics like string theory that there are multiple dimensions of, of space. So is it possible that these other dimensions are uh, associated with UFOs. Of course it is. Uh, we have the multiple worlds theory in, in physics, which suggests that uh, every time we observe anything, uh, any, let's say, a quantum particle, uh, that quantum physics says there, there could be many, many different possibilities, and the multiple worlds theory says they all exist somewhere. Uh, so, uh, there's also a concept known as Hilbert space in mathematics, which is a space of infinitely many dimensions. Uh, I'm inclined to think that the, the way the, the universe seems to follow the findings of mathematics, that it's very likely there are infinitely many dimensions to reality. So uh, whether UFOs come from other planets, other galaxies, or other dimensions of, of space, it's an open question, but there's no reason to rule any of that out at this point. How likely do you think the governments of the world will fully disclose that ETs are real? That's a very good question. And uh, the funny thing is that if, if you look at the UFO literature going back to the 1950s, people thought that Disclosure was about to happen any day now. The government is going to tell us. And there's still people today, uh, including one of the contributors to my recent book, Daniel Sheehan, a very prominent attorney who has been involved in social activism and also UFO disclosure for decades. And, and he feels, yes, it's going to happen soon, very, very soon. And you have to admit, incrementally, there have been more and more disclosures. We, we now know about the Tic Tac sightings that go back to 2004 or so that were reported in the New York Times in 2017 and acknowledged by the U.S. government. So, uh, th and yet now we're, there are whistleblowers. Everybody knows about, uh, or people who follow the field, David Grush, a whistleblower, he got approval from the military to come out and say that uh, according to his investigations, he was tasked with looking into what does the government really know? What other secret projects are there? And he came and he said, yes, we have crashed vehicles that we have retrieved. We have biological material associated with those crashed vehicles. Uh, he was given permission by the government to say those things. And at the same time, other people in the government were saying, no, none of this is true. So, uh, you, you know, there's kind of a smokescreen still going on. But at the same time, there's a trickle of information coming through. And I expect that the, the trickle will keep growing and growing and, and growing. But... Will we ever get to the bottom of this mystery? Uh, ultimately, I think the, the mystery is about us. Who are we, really? What is, what is our consciousness about? That's the big secret. Most people go through life thinking of themselves as uh, biological specimens. We are mammals. We, uh, we are born at a certain date. We uh, grow up. We get married, we have children, and we die. And uh, when we die, our consciousness dies. But actually, the real mystery, the ultimate mystery, is about consciousness itself. 
if consciousness doesn't uh, die when the body dies, then then what is consciousness? And and how if there are advanced beings elsewhere in the universe, whether from other planets or other dimensions, what do they know about consciousness that we as a collective haven't quite figured out yet? Those those to me are the real questions. When you hear stories of people having telepathic communication with ETs, do you accept it? I alluded briefly to the research I did with his fellow Ted Owens. And that was started um, in 1976 and continued until his death in 1987. So an 11-year field study project. And he said he was in telepathic contact with UFOs and he could prove it. Uh, for example, he told me on one occasion he, he was going to make a, a three sightings of UFOs appear in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, now we only got two. We didn't get three. Are you saying that you were with him and saw them as well? No, no. He claimed that they would occur within 100 miles of uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. He claimed that they would be seen by witnesses and reported. So my role in these was interviewing the witnesses after the fact. But on one occasion, he was very excited. He called me up on the phone. He said, I can feel it coming. He said, this is going to be big. This will be the biggest UFO sighting ever. It will be seen by hundreds of people. It will be photographed. He said, a photograph of this UFO is going to be published on the front page of one of your local newspapers. Four days later, that's exactly what happened. And the UFO was seen from the air by a pilot from the ground. It happened over Sonoma State College in Rohnert Park, California. The art department was out there sponsoring a, uh, an artist who had an airplane. His name was Stephen Pileski. And he flew this airplane with smoke trailing out the back, making designs in the sky. So the whole art department was out there with their cameras. A UFO appeared right in his air zone, around 3,000 feet above the campus. It was photographed. It was videotaped. The Berkeley Gazette ran the photo on the front page of the newspaper. And then the video was shown on Channel 9 TV in San Francisco. So... Uh, it surely appears that when Ted Owens claimed he was in telepathic contact with UFOs, he made good on that claim. What is your opinion about crop circles? I mean, I know probably many of them, if not most of them, are made with a two by four and some rope. But some of those out there look really complex. Yeah, to my knowledge, the crop circles that are made by, by people who, using conventional mechanical means are, are very primitive. They're very simple. They're not nothing like these exquisite designs that you see that embody complex mathematics uh, and, and very precise geometrical patterns. Uh, I have never seen anybody who uh, is able to, you know, stomp on the ground with a, a, a board or something to create crop circles, they, they're never able to do anything like that. So the origin of the crop circles remains a mystery. Uh, some people report they see UFOs or they see strange lights uh, when the crop circles appear. It does appear that they're being created by some non-human source, and it's still a mystery. I, there, people who claim that it's all the product of uh, human fakery are, are simply not dealing with the really difficult cases. What do you think about cattle mutilations? It's again, another mystery. There, there's no question that uh, there are hundreds of examples of cattle mutilations well documented, and, and the cattle farmers are particularly disturbed by this. They contact the local sheriffs all across the um, Western states and into the Midwest. And uh, there are examples, for example, uh, where, where a 
a, ca a cow is found in the snow and it has been mutilated surgically with like very precise, uh, the lips are cut out, certain organs are removed and there are no footprints in the snow. Uh, so it's, it, it's inexplicable and very likely has something to do with what we call the paranormal, whether it's UFOs from other planets or beings from other dimensions or vampires, uh, I have no idea, but um, it needs to be seriously investigated. And the, the problem with seriously investigating any of this is, is that the normal materialistic metaphysics that are the basis of conventional science seem to be inadequate. To, to address phenomenon of, of this complexity. A popular topic on my channel is that what we live in is some sort of simulated reality. Is that something you talk about? And if so, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, it's, it, it's come up quite a bit. I've done several interviews with Rizwan Virk, who's written two books on the subject, uh, he comes out of the field of computers. So he likens it to a computer game. And he points out that if you're the uh, software designer, you can manipulate the reality inside of a computer game very much the way our reality appears to be manipulated by all of these paranormal phenomena we're talking about. But I think the, the computer game metaphor is, is a powerful one, but it's also very limited. If we think that we're inside of uh, some computer and that there are aliens outside the computer who are controlling us, uh, to me, that's a way, way too simple-minded way to look at it. There are other levels of control, I think. There, uh, and those, ultimately, those levels have something to do with consciousness, not just our personal consciousness, but you might say a group consciousness or ultimately a universal consciousness. The, the Buddhists, for example, talk about what they call the causal realm of reality, and that anything that uh, occurs in the physical plane is initiated from another level, the causal realm. Uh, you get the same idea actually in, um, to my understanding, although I'm not a physicist, in M theory or membrane theory, that there are these brains, they exist outside of space and time. And when events occur in space and time, they, they start there at the, at the level of what they call the brain, B-R-A-N-E, as in membrane. Uh, so I, I do think it's a good way to look at reality. Uh, I think definitely there's something to it, but uh, one has to be careful not to get caught up in, in, in paranoid conspiracy theories. Because as far as I'm concerned, they are a rabbit hole and, and they don't lead to any good for the people who embrace them. Is there any possibility that we will be able to get an accredited college degree in the study of UFOs? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, the New Thinking Aloud channel currently has a relationship with the California Institute for Human Science. Earlier, before we began the interview, we talked about uh, a scholar in this area, Sean, uh, Sean S. Bjorn Hargens, who is uh, looking at non-human intelligence uh, and also super experiencers, the kind of people who experience many, many things like poltergeists and aliens and uh, Sasquatch and out-of-body experience. There's a whole category of people I encounter them from time to time who are having all of these experiences at once. And uh, he is now the program director for uh, what they call integral noetic sciences. So you can get a degree uh, studying these things. It's actually uh, very rigorous and very philosophical. And uh, I, I think uh, you already told me that uh, he's on your list of potential guests. Yes, that's true. Out of all the guests you've had and all the stories and accountings you've heard, do you have a favorite? UFO story. 
Oh, my. Uh, I have certainly heard a lot. Well, I think one well worth paying attention to is uh, has been reported by Jacques Vallée in a and uh, his partner, Paulo Paula Harris. They've written a book together called Trinity. And what they point out is that about three weeks after the first atomic bomb explosion that took place here in New Mexico um, in 1945, in, uh, on, near the White Sands uh, missile testing base in an area called Trinity, a UFO uh, apparently crashed and was retrieved by the US government. And there were witnesses to all of this who came and saw the army come and haul it away. And they were children at the time, but uh, and they are now deceased. But uh, Jacques Vallée and his partner, Paula Harris, were able to interview them. And their stories are quite consistent and quite believable. Uh, this is a fascinating case because it also shows that there's been a an interest by the uh, UFOs, whatever they are, in the development of nuclear weapons in the United States. This is the very first example, and and it occurred you know long before the famous UFO flap began in 1947. Uh, so. Uh, I think it's a very important case, and it's it's well worth people looking at. And I know Jacques Vallée has now published three editions of his book, Trinity, and in each one, uh, he gathers a little more information and also, of course, responds to people who raise critical questions. Do you feel that there is so much UFO content out there, and the ability to edit video and pictures is so good that even if there would be something that was real, you wouldn't even believe it anymore because of all the fakery. Well, that's a good point. We're, it's, and this is relatively new, the capacity for, for the average person to acquire the uh, ability using AI technology to create fakes. I think the real danger is probably much greater in the political arena where people are you know, creating fake speeches of politicians saying things that they never said, often opposite of what they would say. That's, that's creating a very difficult environment for people to make uh, sense of what politicians are, are doing. So I think it's important to look at what they do, not just what they say. But uh, can it be applied to UFOs? Yes, and, and to other fields of study. It, it means that we have to become even more sophisticated in our abilities to understand, to analyze, and interpret. It means that the general public as a whole needs to become more well-educated. I was looking into your book, and it appeared to me that it was published on 8-8-24 which some people will say that's the Lionsgate portal in numerology. Did you plan it that way? No, I didn't. And I didn't know about the Lionsgate uh, portal in, in numerology. Of course, August is uh, the astrological sign of Leo the lion. Uh, but uh, no, that date was chosen by my publisher, and uh, I would have to ask him. What is the biggest takeaway that you want someone to get from reading your new book? That UFOs are real, that we are not alone, and that we have to consider them in the light of a wide range of other paranormal phenomena, including survival of consciousness after death. If people want to learn more about your book, do they go to your website or Amazon? Uh, they can go to Amazon directly. Uh, we have three books in the New Thinking Aloud Dialogue series. The first one is uh, uh, about uh, survival after death. The second book is a series of 15 interviews with Russell Targ, one of the parapsychologists who pioneered the field of remote viewing and uh, did a lot of work uh, under the auspices of uh, three-letter government agencies. Uh, and the third book on UFOs and, and UAP, all three of these books suggest that we should not discount reports simply because they seem unbelievable. 
In fact, the very fact that they seem unbelievable to me means we better pay more attention to them. Before you leave us, can you give us one last positive message? Well, I can share it with you with my own personal motto, my outlook on the world. It's more of an aspirational motto. I can't say I live up to it, but my goal is to love everyone and everything all the time. Jeff, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.